What's up, YouTube? It's your boy Rojo, Convex Perspective. As always, I'm joined by my co-host, Big Flacco. And today we got a special guest, man. You know, you guys, uh, you guys know who he is, man. You see his picture, Mr. Salinas Report, the Salinas historian, the big man himself. And today he's going to bless us with a little bit of something, man. And Flacco, what's he going to bless us with, brother? Man, we've had a lot of people request a little bit of back history about Salinas, man. So we figured what better person to do this than the Salinas Report. Tell his story about his experience growing up, the, the gang culture, and how bad it's influenced the communities out there in Salinas. Man, Take I it appreciate it. Thank you guys one more time, man. I just want to thank you, uh, Rojo and Flaco, for all for your channel and all the work that you do. Um, I'm, I'm on the same tip as you guys, man. If we could turn a, a positive from a negative, it's all worth it, man. We just reach one individual, one youth, stray away, less funerals, less damage on the streets. I'm all for it, man. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and get into it, man. I never really given my spill, but uh, so I was born in East Salinas. I was born right in the heart of it, right in the heart of it. Um, I was born in Meyer Alley. And Meyer Alley is off of Hebron Street. And Hebron Street was right between Fremont Street and East Market Street. Within 20 yards of my house, I already had three uh, street gangs. So it, it, was, it was a vacuum. I mean, and I didn't choose you know, where I was born. You know, I could easily could have been from LA, New Mexico, uh, another continent, you know, this is just my story and the facts of my life. But um, so my earliest memories, kind of like uh, Henry Hill says, right, as far as back as I could remember, I always wanted to be a gangster. That's what it was, man. My earliest memories were Cholos, Pendletons, Windbreakers, Hairnets, the beanies with the rubber bands on, uh, Converse, Dickies, you name it. And um, by about 1988, we moved over to Soledad Street. Um, every night over there, just uh, where we lived, that was just sirens every single night. Graffiti on the walls every single night. And I think mom and pops kind of caught wind. We're not in a good area. It's the 1980s. We got to move out. About 1988, I moved over there to Soledad Street. Anyone knows that Salinas, uh, Soledad Street is real infamous for one thing, running straight into the heart of what's called Chinatown. So Chinatown is really where all my friends, my closest four or five friends uh, that I grew up with is where we went to hang out. Over there, they had everything. Over there, they had dope, they had hoes, they had pimps. I met a lot of big homies over there. Um, I, I seen shit that I, you know, I, I'm, I'm like, damn, I'm blown away. You know, it's the first time I seen someone getting drugged by, by their hair down the street. That was uh, by, by a homeboy named Richie Boo. Uh, we ended up in, in jail one time and we were laughing about that. But anyways... Uh, I ended up, you know, selling weed to the guys actually at that halfway house and um, which was on the corner of like San Luis and Solidar Street. I live right across the, the south of ours, live right on that corner of uh, San Luis and Solidar Street. And south of ours are really, really big family, man. And they go all the way back, man, hearing stories of all the south of ours and all that. Uh, and, and right across the street was all the halfway house guys. Man, when those guys would get out, I kid you not, man, they're the most to me. Being a kid, you know, having a lot of dysfunction at home, you know, because that's what really I realized later on what gravitated me to everything. You know, Pops is a hustler, but he's just taking advantage of mom, sister, she's protecting me. But I don't want to see none of that shit. I drive to the streets. I don't give a shit. Pops is already going away anyways. Pops is going away for two years at a time, three years at a time. And uh, so mom's kind of felt guilty and she never really wanted to correct me on anything. Like, tell me I'm doing something wrong or anything because she felt it was already a letdown by Pops not being there. Something in her mind, I came to realize later, that's really why she wasn't the disciplinarian. But I started uh, sooner or later, you know, uh, selling work. Uh, I started by just selling over to the halfway house guy. That was their plug. And when the guy was coming around the corner, there was a little parking lot right there and he'd be sweeping. I had a little spot where I would leave it right there. Uh, man, I remember one time I was scared as shit, man. You know, back in the day, being a little youngster, you know, you always want to roll little things, you know, little little joints up and stuff. And I remember one time one of the guys checked me. He goes, hey, man, he goes, how come that bag that I'm getting from you every time gets smaller and smaller? I'm like, oh, shit, man, I got to stop that. You know what I mean? Um, but anyway, these guys were mesmerizing, man, polarizing, big brochas, state bags all the time, state clothes. They would all ask Big Hank or this person, that person. And uh, really, everyone that I grew up with, these are the people that I idolized. So straight up, I wanted to be like them, no other person. I wanted to be like Big Sharky, Gangster, 
Manos, Mosco, Wino, uh, Mateo, uh, who we just heard stories of. Uh, you know, he would just go up and down Seaver, blasting, showing the youngsters how to do it. This is how you do it. Pop, 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 pop. And coming back and, and putting the youngsters down and, and saying, this is how you do it. I've heard a lot of stories of these guys. And that's exactly what I wanted to be like for no other reason. It's just the dysfunction, really, that was in my home. These guys really drilled it in us. Never talk to the police. Never rap. You do everything low profile. Never say anything about anything. And so from elementary school, it, I was just, you know, about fourth grade. I just wanted to get the hell out. I, I didn't want to go back to school no more. And, and I did. But now it's the early 90s. Let's say it's 1990. Exactly. Well, one of my homeboys, his sister, which I thought she was a Norteña because she wore all this red. But then I come to find out, he tells me, no, she's Piru. And I'm like, okay, that's the first time I ever heard of someone in Salinas being Piru. But, you know, colors came out. She had a boyfriend. He was an East Side Crip. This guy was cooking baking soda. So he going inside his sister's house, all I saw was just jars and jars cooking and it's happening and it's happening. So sooner or later, it ended up happening that I happened to sell for the big homies. Now we're in Chinatown every single day. Ain't no one wanna go to school no more. We still had to go to, we still went to school, but only as we picked and we chose. The laws for truancy were a lot different back then. Back then it's not like now where just district attorney will come and uh, you know you, they'll get on you. But I didn't want to do that because every time when I knew I went to school, I knew I was missing action. There was kegs, there was DJs, there was parties, or things going on. My friend's older brothers were running from placements. They're running out. They're you know getting out of YA on parole. So it was just, it was a vacuum. It was all happening in. That's what happened back in the 1990s. About the early 1990s, Salinas had established what was called the Gang Task Force. I kid you not, man. There was a cop on the gang task force, he looked straight, straight like a uh, Pac-Man. I, I shit you not, man. Officer Birch, I shit you not, man. A uh, matter of fact, there was one incident where I guess I always looked older than my age. Um, they were always put me in the minor uh, side of the PD station, which is desk. You know, it's no cell. It's just you get in, in a room with the desk and chairs. You can see everyone else working. You're a minor. You're not supposed to go where the cells are because that's where the adults go one time i remember they got me and they threw me in the cell and i kid you not i'm like 13 and uh, i don't know what was going on i mouthed off to about three of the cops when they opened up i gave them the bird and i kid you not they just blitzed me now this is different times okay so <laughs> there's no cameras there's no gonna catch you on what's going on and none of that stuff i got blitzed and then after that about an hour or two later they opened the door and they said diaz what are you doing here he just left me walk out the back. I walked out with a shiner, some scratches. Hey, it was a whole different time. You know what I mean? Very, very early 1990s. So, <clears throat> and I recently just reconnected uh, with the old friend, man. Big shout out to you. You know who you are, man. We were talking about the other day for hours on the phone, going over a lot of uh, Salinas history because there was a couple things that happened in the history of Salinas that really dropped like the atomic bomb on red on red and on red on blue. And most of these incidents I'm gonna talk about right now, I'll mention some of them happened in the very, very early uh, 1990s. Um, and so um, we'll talk about uh, one of them right now. It was a 1990. It was outside the Portuguese hall in Salinas. There was a quinceanera going on inside the hall, okay? And uh, it was it was an ELC quinceanera. So that means everyone from inside there was from East Las Casitas. Okay, the guy, the Fremont boys came over, and they uh, th there was something already brewing because by the time they found out who was inside and who was hosting the quinceanera, one of the Fremont boys he grabbed a brick and he threw it right through the window. Sas! And the guys came out, and guess what happened? I know, I know, it sounded like Gunner right there. Huh? Sas! <laughs> That's good. The, uh, the brick went through. They came out and it was bullets rang and there was a dead body right there and rest in peace to Gordo. So these are some of the incidents that just sparked it. This is red on red. This is really red on red stuff that's happened in the early 1990s. Okay. The guy got 10 years back then, you know, the laws were a whole lot different. It wasn't like right now. It wasn't really like right now. I mean, there were so many of these stories that America's most wanted. 
ended up making stories of Iselinas. They made story after story. They're on YouTube. We can post the links out there of uh, one incident. I'll give you one incident. It was another 1990 incident. It was uh, La Posada, LPT, La Posada 13. These are some, some guys back in the day. These, uh, you know, and these guys were with the business, man. They were really with the business, man. I mean, uh, so the story goes was they're just hanging out, they're partying, they're drinking beers in their neighborhood. And after a couple beers, they just said, you know what? Let's go out there and find some enemies and go riding. And they went ahead and they rolled up on a party. And the party was of uh, Casitas, ELC, another ELC. What I had noticed, and I was talking to my buddy of mine, is a lot of the guys from ELC ended up really climbing the ladder and going, going all the way. These guys are real vicious, They're really, really notorious. And uh, again, this story that I'm telling you now is on America's Most Wanted. And uh, it was about 1990s. And um, so basically the guys went riding for enemies and uh, they basically pulled the trigger on when they found some guys that were hanging out at the house party wearing red, red sweaters. Everyone's wearing red sweaters. Next thing you know, they pulled out, they started shooting, pop, 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 pop. One guy got hit, rest in peace, baby gangster. He was from Casitas. This is not a red on red, this is a red on blue. And all of a sudden it just turned now just going back and forth, man. The La Posada guys really had a, a lot of hitters on their team, man. I remember some of the Sudeños from La Posada. There was a group of brothers, and they were at the Albertos, man. These guys really would campaign and really would go hard, man. I mean, just, just you know, there were just one, – one incident happened where there was a football game, okay? Back in 1990, there was a football game between La Posada and Norteños. I don't remember exactly if there were Semskers, Casitas, or just Eastsiders or Fremont boys. La Posada was playing them uh, right there and smack dab in the middle of the football field. One of these Albertos, Alberto guys from La Posada. Uh, you know, when, we, when they set up these football games, it's supposed to be like a mutual understanding. We're going through this football game to determine the winner. If the, if the leader wants to go head up with the other leader, we can go ahead and handle that. But at this point, someone took it upon themselves to walk on the football field, pull out the cuete, and, and, and killed. It was another tragedy that took place. This is on the La Posada side. These incidents that happened in the early 90s, I mean, kicked it off, man. You know, kicked it off. Um, Baby Gangster, who I mentioned, his mom ended up being a big advocate for anti-gangs. Uh, she actually teamed up with another individual's mom. There was another incident. I want to say this was about 1993. Um, there were some Sureños that were rolling down Williams, okay? They were caught in traffic. Once they were clocked in traffic, a lot of the guys from Casitas used to live around uh, Cluster Park. Anyone knows Salinas knows Cluster Park. Cluster Park, uh, back in the 90s and maybe in the 80s, but I moved away in 88 and more to the downtown area, used to be the hangout spot. That's where, you know, the guys would go, the, their low riders, the cholas, the cholos. That was Cluster Park on the east side. A lot of Casitas boys lived all up and down right there. So back then, remember, they had phones. So they didn't have none of this stuff to get, be able to get the word out fast or nothing. Next thing you know, a phone call was made from someone that saw them getting stuck in traffic. And it happened where these guys just came out. This is right across the street from the bread box. Uh, the bread box is on Sanborn. This is like a recreational area where a lot of people, you know, they had the anti-gang message. They had the after-school program. It wasn't deterring anyone from gangs. It was just you know, it was going to be which gang controls it, and, and predominantly it was Norteños. And so, um, so when the shots rang out, they ran up on these guys. The shots rang out, a ricocheted bullet, bing, ended up coming off the door, boom, and hit one other individual, and he died right outside that red box. The reason I said that was his mom, Gloria, and baby gangster's mom, both of them ended up being strong anti-gang advocates, anti-gang advocates. And to me, I'm finding we're in 2021. Uh, you know, I go to the juvenile hall. I go to the youth center uh, once a month, uh, which I'll talk about maybe right now. Uh, and really, that, that kind of message, I don't see it catching the youngsters, but really individuals like Rojo, like you, Flaco, like me, that maybe have a background, that not maybe, but have a background in this. They're more prone to listen. They're more prone to listen to what's going on. 1993, another incident happened. And this one, it was a bad one. This is a red on red incident. And it was called the Halloween Massacre. This is, this is what one of the biggest ordeals that ever happened on red on red in the history of Salinas. Basically what I was told was 
Fremont boys were in the house. ELC was in the house. There was an argument at the, at the keg. And next thing you know, shots rang out. When the shots rang out, there was three dead bodies. Seven people hit overall. It was bad. I mean, it was so bad. A uh, June bug lived on the corner of Market and Tip. And I guess uh, you know, a lot of people know him as Junior. Uh, well, I knew him as June bug. Uh, and I remember there was a big meeting at his house when that happened because this is the first time. It was kind of like a like a red alert meeting. You know, things are really happening. Things are boiling over. They hit the boiling point and the thermometer pops. It was just it, it was happening. Prior to that Halloween, and you know those guys, uh, you know all of them were Fremont boys that got shot. But they ended up this shooting back. A couple guys from ELC got hit. Right prior to that, I ended up meeting Big Tino. He was on Solidar Street. This is the guy. He took me under his wing. You know, I'm a little kid. Again, I'm I'm not knowing. Again, I'm I'm more mature in age. I was more the quiet guy growing up. I wasn't really the joker. I didn't really start talking until YouTube and maybe right before it. Um, but uh, he took me right under his wing. This guy, he took me around and he introduced his his dad lived on East Market uh, between Tip and Eucalyptus. In the back was a uh, little man and Pablo. They lived right in the back. June Bug was like two houses down. Weasel was right there. Um, he introduced me to other guys, Ghost, Sean, Angelo. I mean, all these guys. He, he's the first one that put me down with the beeper. That was the first time I ever had a beeper. I thought I was somebody. I had a beeper now. Beep, beep, beep. I thought I was somebody. <laughs> going to the pay phone, putting something in. What, what's going on? Oh, this guy's going to pull up in a white cut list and give him this. Okay, I thought I was, I'm doing that like in seventh grade already. Again, and all my other friends are doing normal stuff, man. They're, you know, except my four or five closest friends, they're in the game. They're doing exactly what I was doing. But um, Tino, he's the one that took me around all these other individuals, uh, like uh, uh, Gabe, Big Gabe. Um, I ended up meeting uh, through Tino, uh, Matt again, Gabe. I was running into a lot of these guys. Lobo, I met a lot of these other guys through him because he was actually one of the contributors. So he was just... So what he taught me as being a kid is, man, I remember I used to get so pissed off. He would have me waiting in the car for hours outside of houses. I was so pissed. I'm like, how come I can't go in the house? Shut up. Don't say nothing. Yeah, I was I was learning discipline in this process, right? Also, like, you know, about learning how to conceal things, you know, put it in your nuts, put it in the shoe. I don't know how many times I got pulled over by PD and something was in my shoe. Something was in my nuts. And they didn't, I'm like, whew, a lot of stuff. But man, Big Tino, his house was like home base. That's really what his house was, a home base. He was at 1063 right there on East Market Street. And again, all these individuals are happening. So fast forward a little bit, all these incidents are happening. I start doing weekends in juvenile hall. I get my first weapons uh, charge. It was called, they, they downplayed it, I guess, into uh, shooting into inhabited dwelling, something like that. I'm doing weekends in juvenile hall. You did, yeah, something. It was like a, was it like a 246? Yep. Something like that, right? It was like a 246, yeah. Mm. So I started doing weekends in juvenile hall. Man, weekends in juvenile hall. Well, I was so stressed out. Two days of seeing sunsets, but I got my taste inside of there. And I seen a, a lot of a lot of older guys, guys that would come back from YA, the older guys in the Salinas Juvenile Hall. If you happen to go to B unit. That's usually the guys that have been to YA already or just the troll makers that have felonies, robberies, and all that stuff. I started doing that. I went from there to the camp. Uh, and the camp, we actually called it Caesar's Palace. That's what we ended up calling that camp right there because uh, I guess they, they figured Salinas needs something higher than the level of the juvenile hall, but lower than a YTS and a YA, right? A camp. And so they ended up building a camp right there in Salinas. So the whole mentality behind this camp, their mentality, their program, their instituting was peace building. So their whole get down was, we're gonna put one Norteño in a room with three Sureños. We're gonna put one Sureño in a room with three Norteños. And I guess that was their mentality. Hence what happened, it ended up evolving into what we call Caesar's Palace. Every night, black eyes, it's just happening. People are running, hitting the fences. I mean, it was just, you would just hear it, right? And so a lot of the guards were sympathizers or they were cousins of homeboys. Uh, so we had action at pulling anyone out on. 
I mean, the, the, the more, one of the most vicious times I ever seen, one of the most vicious incidents was these guys, they were from Greenfield. There was a couple of homeboys. I didn't know anything to be neta, keep it 100 with you guys. I didn't know that South County cities even existed until I went to juvenile hall camp. I, I didn't know. And I had to be real with the homies. I didn't know there was a solid dad. I didn't, you know, cause we're just growing up in the neighborhood. We're hanging out in driveways. I'm not really driving anywhere. This is, you know, what I wanted to be. It's where I wanted to be. I met a couple guys from Greenfield. One of the guys, Joker, um, uh, and a couple other ones that they, they missed me. But anyways, there's three of them. So one time a guy came in, bam. And uh, when the guys come in, they have you kind of, you know, face the wall, or get away from the middle. Some guy's coming in. He's a fish. This guy was a Sureño from King City. And so we ended up going to school. And when I got to school, another go, the guy from, from Greenfield, he hit me up. He's like, Gonzo, what's going on? I told him, man, what's going on? And he goes, hey, he goes, they brought in a guy, Mosqueda, from King City. I'm like, well, who is that? I don't know. He's like, he's public enemy number one. Tonight, Caesar's Palace. I'm like, okay. I kid you not, man. They did that guy so bad. Uh, he ended up waking up with black eyes both eyes closed rope marks and you heard it and i was like damn this is you know this is it, it was a year program it was a year program so that was going on that same individual man i feel bad for that guy man you know a lot of the sureños there though that was the very first time they ended up putting me in a room with the sureño i i wasn't used to that and i'm talking about like a two-man room i'm not talking about like a double bunk because there are two double bunk rooms i was in a the guy that i was in the room with I don't want to digress, but the guy that I was in the room with, he must have had like 30 fights, man. I mean, he would, they would call him out. He would rumble, come back, and me and him kept it cordial, you know, because to be honest, to keep it 100, no one ever told me, hey, you need to get him. And it was a 90s thing. It was kind of, it was a whole different vibe. It was a whole different feel. Uh, he wasn't pushing up, and I, I just, I respected this guy, you know, and I can see now how I just realized these guys are all rasa, man. Their family look like my family when they're visiting. It's the same damn thing, man. But anyways, that guy I was telling you about, Mosqueda, man, I remember Philip Sparks Jr. He was the son, Philip Sparks Jr. Man, I remember he just, uh, on some pride shit, we're hanging out at the bleachers. There's like 30 of us. He's like, man, I'll go and, and, and give him, you know, I'll serve him right now. And someone just said, ah, oh, you won't. And you know how it is back then. You're like, ooh. You know, when someone says, ooh. Trying, trying to instigate. Here's pride, yeah. right? instigating here's your ego here's your pride i kid you not with they had rhino boots inside this camp the black rhino boots he walked up to him the sudanio didn't even know what was going on man he had his head down he gave him a field goal that would have went like 60 yards man put him in a coma they took him back immediately and he, he, he they took him to ya little philip and this guy so this you know again it's back and forth the camp happened i ended up turning 18 with the nine-year ya suspension um, there at that camp, I actually got possession of a controlled substance in an institution. When I went to the camp, the judge told me, this is the last time I don't even want to see your face. I've been seeing me way too much. Uh, I went with the nine-year wife suspension. When I came back, I remember moms, my sister came to visit me, and, and I was telling them just like this. I told them straight up. I said, you know what? I said, on this one, uh, no, I'm not going to stay local. They're probably going to take me to Sacramento, Stockton, or I'm going to go out of the area. I'm talking to my mom in Spanish. She doesn't know what's going on. She doesn't know what that means. I think, you know, I'm going to get the nine and white. And she goes, oh, no, no, no. She ended up pulling a badass lawyer, um, spending almost a house note down payment. And I ended up just turning 18, going to the jails, going to prison ultimately, uh, did a 90-day observation. I don't even know what the hell a 90-day observation. When I got a lawyer and he told me, you're going on a 90-day observation, I'm like, what the hell is that? I don't, I don't know what a 90-day observation was. I'm in the county jail with all that Operation Black Widow stuff was going on. Everyone knows what's going on, who's who, what's what. Everyone's in the pods and everything's happening. All of that stuff. But one of the best years of my life was in 2002 because that was the year that I ultimately met my wife. And uh, my wife was a square bear. She didn't know nothing from nothing. I mean, literally one time, I remember I took her to a, a, a probation uh, officer meeting. And the guy, he was, he was, uh, he knew me from the juvenile. He was a juvenile probation officer and then he turned adult. His name was Troy. Orale, Helena Troy, huh? He was Troy. And uh, he ended up calling me back. And when I sat down, the very first thing I remember, he told me, he goes, he goes, hey, what's up with your wife? I said, why? What's up with her? 
He goes, look at all the colors she got on. I said, hey, we got to pause this right said, now. She don't know what me and you know. Yeah, so uh, my wife, she was totally oblivious to anything, man. She she uh, was just listening to like Spanish music. It was from a whole nother world, like Luis Miguel, Talia, and all that. So she's wearing like a red fubu shirt and some red uh, uh, shoes. And I told him, Troy, man, I said, she's from a whole nother world. She doesn't know what me and you know. Uh, she was a church girl. She actually got me into church. And in 2004, uh, after I did my 90 day op, in 2003, I got caught with a firearm. This one, they were trying to throw everything at me, man, because they had the extra magazines. Um, they raided the house, ended up almost catching a federal charge because the gun had a laser on there, um, all that stuff. Uh, that was in 2003. So I had to fight that thing, man. And I did end up fighting it. But in 2004, like I said, my wife was all, it was in church. I ended up going, I ended up getting baptized inside the Christian church, man. And I remember just going inside that water. That was the best experience of my life. When I came up, it just felt like everything just lifted and lifted. But me being the background that I had and grew up the way I did, it was hard for those old tendencies to go back. But I do remember, man, like it started burning inside of me, like going to a a rap studio where, where, where there was like, you know, a lot of gangsters, they were just making gangster rap music in Salinas. I just remember grabbing that liquor bottle and still feeling like conviction, like, no, you shouldn't be doing that. Uh, doing home invasions and robberies and everything else, just feeling bad, man. I just, I just, it, it, it wasn't, I just knew that it was wrong, man. I started feeling that conviction inside of me. But again, my wife was the best thing that happened to me in 2002 Man, long story short, we'll just fast forward a little bit. I'm in Salinas Valley. Now I'm in Salinas Valley. When I get to Delano, it's hot as hell. It's like right now. It's hot as shit. It's hot as hell. Like right now, I get to Delano about late July. It's like 105. It's suffocating. It's hot as hell. And I remember, you know, how the, the counselor comes up to you and he lets you uh, say your piece, right? Like, well, where do you want to go? Or something like that. I guess they already got what they got written down in administration but I guess they ask you something. Maybe it's just due process or whatever. I said, well, I want to go to Soledad or Salinas Valley. He goes, no, you have too many points to go to Soledad. He goes, in Salinas Valley, I never had anyone ask me to go there. So I was like, oh, shit. Okay. But to me, it was like a muscle memory. Like, well, I want to go. Because obviously, I was writing letters to my wife. And she was like, I'm not going to go halfway across the state and fight in lines and, and fight to get a fast number, wake up and st spend the night in the parking lot and all this other stuff that I realized, you know, she ended up doing for a lot of years. Um, and so he ended up saying, well, do you mind staying uh, up to a year in the reception center? I said, yeah, I don't care. It was hot as shit. I didn't want to be there. Fucking there ain't that air that's blowing out of that vent is hot as shit. Plus all the other shit that's going on. I'm like, shit, man. I mean, it was just, I think they had just built the, the second North Kern. Now, that was like in 2003. I think they had just built that North Kern. I know that that, that second North Kern was right after the 2000. I don't think it was a 90s institution, but I could be wrong. Um, but anyways, that, I remember about that time when they passed that law. It was called 1020 Life, man. They were, the laws were really getting strict around that time. Long story short, I hit Salinas Valley. Uh, as soon as you go through everything you go through, I ended up finding a cat, uh, an old homie, that me and him in the county jail had a little thing going on from the outside to the inside, if you know what I mean. So when we saw each other, we said, you know what? Let's run it back. And so we ended up running it back, picked up where we left off. Everything's going, everything's going. And it's, you know, things are going, you know, it's a good Christmas. It's a good Thanksgiving, right? You, you know what I mean? Just things are going now. Okay. I just remember one night, I just, the scripture came to me. It was like Psalm, it was like Psalm 12 too. And it said, with double hearts and double tongues, do they worship me? I felt so, this scripture so impressed on my heart. Immediately, I remember just getting up and going through the motions of another typical day. And I was sailed up with another semester from Salinas. Uh, we weren't set up with each other right away. But once I saw him right across the thing, uh, we ended up, you know, getting that worked out. Where next thing you know, he came in there and we're rolling. And I remember, and he, you know, because you get really close with your cellies, you know, you tell each other stuff. You know, he was also baptized and in the church and uh, had just backslid, was doing the same thing I did. I tasted it of the heavenly gift, but just kept on doing my thing. 
I remember that day when that scripture hit me, I got up and I told him, I said, you know what? I said, I don't want to do it anymore. He goes, what do you mean? I said, I mean everything. I just, I just, I'm tired of it. I said, there, there's, I'm going home to mom's same room forever. Mom's getting gray hair. Uh, my dad had passed away when I was in Salinas Valley. My grandma passed away about two months later, man. And uh, that really hit me, especially being my dad's only son. I, I wanted one opportunity just to be able to go out there after I had the right mind and be able to talk to Pop, soak in the moments, get with him. I didn't get a forward that, but only God knows why. I remember I'm telling him that. And the first thing he told me, he goes, well, what about the work? I'm like, I don't care about it. What about the people that owe? I don't care about that too. You know, I had people that owed me money and they would avoid me. You know what I mean? <laughs> they didn't want to go out. You know, they were avoiding me and all this stuff. So, man, I mean, that, that in a nutshell, as soon as I came home, I said, you know what? I got to do something to kind of undo all the damage I've done. Kind of like Pastor David Rocha. Big shout out to Pastor David Rocha. Undo all the damage that we've done. What can we do? You know what I mean? Um, man, it, just like that interview that you had did, Flaco, man, uh, with Big Joe. You remember that interview you did with Big Joe M? Oh, man. I mean, sh I, I, I always thought I only had one fear inside of me, the fear of God. But now after I heard that interview, it was so impactful. I'm like, I have another fear. The other fear is that I won't be here for my family. Uh, that, that's what I got from his interview. Man, man, Joe M, if you're hearing this, shout out to you, brother. I hope you do open up a channel one day. When he opened up his Instagram, I must have been the second or third subscriber. Big shout out to you. I mean, these messages. And this is what I started YouTube for. I started YouTube just really to put a message out there. because I really ain't got the time to do none of this stuff. I got a lot of hustles going on for it. Now I go over to Caesar's Palace once a month. Uh, now I go over to the juvenile hall once a month and I'm just trying to redeem the time. So in brief, you know, I just kind of, you know, gave you a little synopsis. We could talk hours on this thing, man, but I appreciate you guys for bringing me over to the channel, giving a little bit of my spill to all your subscribers and all your followers. You're on the right channel. Stick right here, man. Join the members only to get the exclusive content. Support, support, support. I mean, if we're going to support anything, we got to support the positive. So I just want to thank you again, gentlemen. Hey, thank you, man. We appreciate you uh, taking your time to, to enlighten us as to your little mission. You know what I mean? Every Everybody's mission, you know, that ends in success, man. I love it. You know what I'm saying? I, I don't like to hear the 27 to life stories or did you hear about such and such that got shot stories, man. I like to see you out there doing what you're supposed to be doing with your family, you know, providing, have, hustling and, and working and, and and not with the negativity, man. It's excellent, bro. You're of like mind is what we're trying to push with what you're trying to push, man. And it, it, man, I appreciate you coming on, man. 100. percent I agree. I agree, man. Most definitely. Thanks for coming on, man. Like we always try to do on the show, man. We're all about pushing that positive message. We're all about promoting change. You know, for people like you to come on here and tell your testimonies and the things that you went through. We all have different stories, but we all have similar experiences, man. And like we've said before numerous times, the game banging lifestyle, the criminal lifestyle, the drug lifestyle, it only, it only results in three things, death, prison sense, or homelessness. Throwing your whole family and your life away. You know what I mean? And hopefully as we continue to push this message out there for people to give the opportunity to change, people are going to hear it, man. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I just want to thank you personally, man. Salinas Report, man. We support the channel, man. Check them out. He has a lot of good spills on there. I appreciate you guys, man. All hey, guys. also, man, I know that's only a part of what we were able to touch on in this time, man. So hopefully you won't mind coming back and maybe elaborating a little bit about your journey in prison and, you know, what you got going on in the future. You know what I mean? And things of that nature. Because, uh, hey, man, I, I know, I know you got a much bigger story than what we were just able to cover right now. You know what I mean? So hopefully yep. that door will be open in the future. You come back on and, you know, whatever. Yeah. Make That's it right, happen. man. I appreciate you, gentlemen. We'll talk 100%. about uh, uh, other things, and uh, there's a lot more detail. I just don't want to yeah. go hour after hour. For after sure, hour. for we'll sure. You know, boxing, yeah. also, I got a little bit of a boxing history that I that I got into post uh, me getting out and a lot of other things. But hey, if it's just to help one youth, I'm all for it. Yes, so, sir. is it true that you're professional, you're a professional boxer? <laughs> no, 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 no. I stayed amateur. I stayed amateur. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. I, I stayed amateur. I started getting involved in 2012. 
the reason that I'll say it right now, well, now that we're touching on the subject, the reason I got into boxing, well, I just, I wanted to start working out. I've been the heaviest I've ever been in my life. But, uh, and really when I got inside that boxing gym, you know, I was never much of a fighter. I wasn't a fighter. I got jumped on many a times and that made me start carrying weapons real quick where everyone knew me that I just had weapons here, there, I had straps here, there, ankle straps, this strap, shoulder, all kinds of shit, right? Looking like a last man standing. But when I was, uh, in, uh, when I got in the boxing gym, I saw it, I said, you know, and next, you know, coach says, do you want some? You know, inside my uh, my heart, I'm like, oh shit. You know, I, I said yes, but in my head, I'm like, damn, you you messed up. I thought you are about to get broke off. You know, but again, from the lifestyle and in the background I had, I said, let's go for it. So, I got more stories when it comes to that and all that experience I'm bringing to the table with this June 26th event, and uh, we're about 10 days out, gentlemen. <laughs> Hell yeah, yeah. That's, I'm, I'm excited. Yeah, I'm wait. excited. Yeah, we I'm definitely got to get a part two in and talk some more, man, for sure. Just let me know. Yes, sir. Yes, sir, man. Hey, anyway, thank you, Salinas Report, man. Much love. If you guys ain't subscribed to Salinas Report, you got to check it out. Great content. And as you just seen, a great dude. And, uh, man, yeah, the fight, man. Woo! 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 Bro, I'm excited. <laughs> I mean, I, hey, I just looked and I seen it. Today was the 16th. I'm like, damn. We're leaving in less than 10 days, man. The fight's in 10 days, man. I can't wait. It's going to yep, be dope, yep. man. But Don't forget to order that. Don't time, forget to man. click the link, you guys. Yeah, appreciate hey, no your time, brother. Gentlemen. Anytime, you guys. All right, man. Have a good night, man. Have a good night, Mike. You as well.